tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. This woman believes she is under siege by the devil. She sought the help of Project Hope, a group including medical professionals who arranged this exorcism for her. Can this controversial ritual really help? 1998 was a bad year for Las Vegas millionaire Ted Binion. He was forced out of the casino he owned. He heard allegations that his girlfriend was unfaithful. Then there was his drug overdose. Was it an accident or murder? A Caribbean cruise, soft breezes, warm sun, a little shipboard romance. But what if one of your group vanished without a trace? That's precisely what happened to 23-year-old Amy Bradley and her family fears foul play. Can nightmares come true? When Tom Wright dreamt that his mother was attacked while transporting a prisoner, he wished he'd said something to her. But in an odd way, his dream may have saved her life. Join me for another intriguing edition of Unsolved Mysteries. Remember the movie The Exorcist? If you saw it, you will probably never forget the scenes of a little girl who was possessed by the devil and the ordeal of her exorcism. That was fiction, but in fact, exorcisms are performed even today. And as you will see, they are nearly as frightening and disturbing as the movie, perhaps even more. Oh my God, I'm heartily sorry. Be still, be still, devil. Listen to the prayer. Your prayers. This is not a reenactment. I won't give her all my back for too long. Be gone. Be gone. The people yeah. conducting oh, it God. say it is an actual yeah. exorcism. No. It defies conventional psychiatric approaches. A 29-year-old woman, whom we are calling Kathy is convinced that she is possessed by demons. Kathy has undergone years of traditional medical and psychiatric treatment. She says nothing helped. So she turned to a seven-member group based in Hartford, Connecticut called HOPE, the Hartford Office of Paranormal Exploration. By the time I got to the point of contacting the HOPE Foundation, I was willing to do anything. I had been through the ringer. I had been in hospitals. I had been, had people pray over me. I had, I had pretty much done everything. The Hope Foundation claims to have organized and overseen nearly 100 exorcisms since its founding just a year ago. Clients are first interviewed to determine whether exorcisms would be beneficial as treatment could you begin by telling us when all of this started? Probably in my teens and... Dr. Joseph Klimek is an internist and the director of the Department of Medicine at Hartford Hospital. He co-founded HOPE and knows their very existence might seem controversial. You can't explain everything with science. Uh, everything is, is not black and white. Everything is not in a scientific textbook and in my 26 years of medicine, I've seen things and experienced things for which there is no explanation. The HOPE team also includes, among others, a social worker, a psychic, and a registered nurse. We want to help the clients that are already beset by demonic entities. We, that's, we, want, it. we want them to know that we're here and that we can help them. Once again, this is not a reenactment. Have there been tragedies in the family? She's going out. I killed her. Oh. I killed her. I killed her. 
Kathy, we're right here. We're holding on to you. I do believe that some of the people that we have been working with are possessed by an evil, demonic spirit uh, that harasses them, uh, devalues them, physically abuses them, spiritually abuses them, and we can get rid of it. And we have done that in a number of our cases. Most in the psychiatric community turn a critical eye to the Hope Group. Dr. Wayne Sandler is a psychiatrist and an associate professor of psychiatry at UCLA. He believes that the Hope organization perpetuates a myth when it says that patients are possessed by the devil. These people believe that, that exorcism is the treatment. I see these disorders in a very different way. The psychiatric community doesn't believe in possession and clearly believes that there is some psychotic process going on where they're delusional, believing that they are possessed by some other personality, and clearly there are other forms of treatment to try to help these people. Push it out. Just push it away from you. That's good, girl. That's good. Is it mental illness? Or can a person indeed become possessed, as the members of Hope believe? They say the process begins with an infestation the point at which demons invade a person's life. A woman we shall call Jane believes two evil entities, a male and a female, took over when she used a crystal pendulum. Jane was learning the techniques of hypnotherapy. I want you to watch the pendulum move back and forth. Breath is going in and out. I picked the pendulum up one evening to practice it, and the pendulum began to move on its own. I realized at that point that something was around me and was trying to communicate with me. Jane says that her demons began to poison her every thought and action. The actual first symptoms was in hearing voices, and the voices began to accompany uh, the movement of the, the pendulum, and it, it began to dictate to me how to live my life in a very unpleasant way. I was told what I could eat, when I could eat, with whom I could eat. I was told how to wear my hair. I was told with whom I could converse. It became very clear to me that something demonic was occurring in my life. All of these activities, pendulums, Ouija boards, tarot cards, channeling are all doors that, that people open. And what people don't understand, and this is very important, is that it's not your intent, but it's your activity that will open the door and let these demonic entities into your life. The Hope Group says that after the infestation phase, the symptoms of possession become more extreme. Kathy claims that many demons began to take over when she was a straight A student in high school. But when she went away to college, she felt they became uncontrollable. I just remember my freshman year looking in the mirror one day and just thinking, I, I don't recognize who I'm looking at or what I'm looking at. And it was a darkness that I saw through my eyes that I had never seen before. <laughs> strange things were happening. I ran outside with only a towel on, which was completely out of character for me. Basically, that's when the paramedics were called, the police were called, and I was taken to the hospital because they thought I was suffering from psychiatric disorders. People would like to believe that it's not them and it's the devil and it's a possession, but it really is more a psychotic process. Some of these problems could be consistent with a psychotic disorder that may be a biochemical imbalance that could be genetically linked or can be triggered by certain life traumas and you would need to evaluate that. Kathy claims that over the years she has been diagnosed as suffering from depression, anxiety, 
and schizoaffective disorder. She tried traditional medical and psychiatric treatments, but she believes they didn't work. I began to hear voices in my head, and I thought, well, maybe this is part of a psychiatric disorder. Um, when a little farther down the line, the voices started coming through me in a very evil way. That's when I knew this is not something in my mind. This is something that is beyond my understanding. And that's when I began to seek spiritual help. The Hope Group advised Kathy to undergo a series of exorcisms. What you are about to witness is her second exorcism. Bishop Robert McKenna is in charge of the procedure. He is an ordained priest in an order of Catholicism that is not part of the Roman Catholic Church. He claims to have performed 200 other exorcisms. Before the exorcist performs the exorcism, he has to prepare himself. The bishop will fast for three days. In fact, in the old literature, it's called the Black Fast. He also says a number of prayers to prepare himself for the battle that he's about to engage. What keeps you in there? No! Tell me your name. <coughs> the name of God, answer my question. During the exorcism, he uses a number of sacramentals. Sacramentals are objects in the Catholic Church that have been made holy, and holy water is one of them. Holy water is sprinkled on the person, it's also sprinkled in the environment, and anything evil hates it. Be still, devil, and listen to the prayers. Be still. Keep your foul mouth shut and listen to the prayers. Kathy was fully aware of the changes coming over her during the exorcism. I can feel this strength come through me that is not my own strength from whatever supernatural force this is fighting whoever is trying to help me. You didn't know we were going to be this strong this time, did you? You didn't know. You didn't know. We're still here. We're still here. It was the first time I ever seen anything like that. The growling, the, the tongue lashing out, uh, just a sense of pure hatred. I've dealt with people who are drug-induced, drunk, um, mentally ill, and never during the screaming and, and fighting that they put up had I had the feeling of pure hatred that she was releasing during this exorcism. This is our domain! No. Say the Apostles' no. Creed with me, devil. No. Say the Apostles' Creed with me. No, no. I believe no. in God. No. Yes, say it. No. No. Yes. No. In the name of God, repeat it after no. me. No. No. I believe in God. No, I believe in God. The Father Almighty. The Father Almighty. The Creator of heaven and earth. The Creator of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our no. Lord. Say it. Say it in the name of God. God won't forgive me. Because you won't repent. That's why he won't forgive you. Never repent for your sins, devil. See, the, see with me the act of contrition. Oh, my God, I am heartily sorry. Oh, my God. For having offended thee. Thank you. Come on out of it. Come on, babe. They put up a good, good struggle, but I know they, they're, okay. they're going. There were some that left. Mm -hmm. I could feel them. I could feel them leave. An hour later, a dramatic episode for Kathy has ended. The Hope Foundation and the priest have recommended that she participate in at least one more exorcism until she feels her demons are completely gone. It's very, very difficult to name the exact time when a person has been cured of a demonic entity. It is a process that takes months. It does not happen overnight. We often, we all say to our clients, when you get out of the chair after an exorcism, do not expect to be cured. There's definitely some improvement. Something that Bishop said to me, he said, as hard as it is, he said, this is in, in God's timing, not ours. Kathy may feel better at first, but according to Dr. Sandler, the effect can be short-lived and ultimately harmful. 
my professional opinion of this is that that these people are suffering from some form of mental illness and do need traditional treatment. Uh, personally, you know, it's very difficult from a scientific standpoint and professional standpoint to accept this as a means of a cure. Since we taped Kathy's exorcism, she reports that she's continuing to improve and has a job for the first time in 12 years. She has not undergone another exorcism. And while most medical experts do not recommend exorcism as a treatment for any kind of illness or disorder, Kathy and the people at the Hope Foundation believe that in certain cases, exorcism can be a useful treatment. Next, a Las Vegas dancer finds a dead body of her millionaire boyfriend the day after he reportedly instructed his attorney to write her out of his will. Las Vegas, Nevada. Each year, millions of people spend more than $57 billion in a frenzy of gambling fever. The stakes are high. Temptation can sometimes turn sinister. I need somebody to help me. Ted Binion? September 17, 1998. 26-year-old Sandy Murphy called 911. Well, he's just not breathing. I don't know. I... But it was too late. Her boyfriend, Ted Binion, was dead. A heroin addict apparently overdosed on drugs. At first glance, it had all the marks of accident or suicide. Then disquieting rumors began to circulate. A discrepancy between the time Binion died and the time Sandy Murphy called 911. Binion may have died as much as nine hours earlier. That made everyone start to wonder. Was Ted Binion's death an accidental overdose, suicide, or was it foul play? It is a mystery as intriguing as a glitter city itself. It involves a millionaire gambler, a sexy young showgirl, a treasure trove buried in the desert, and a question of murder. Ted Binion was a multimillionaire, an icon of the Las Vegas Strip, and a prominent member of the family that owned one of gambling's most famous casinos, a casino that bore their own name, Binion's Horseshoe. In its heyday, Binion's Horseshoe was unlike any other casino in Las Vegas. It was literally the place you went when you wanted to place that sky's the limit wager. Ted was a part owner of Binion's Horseshoe at a time when it was the, the most successful casino in Las Vegas. He liked the atmosphere. He really had passion for that job. He liked what he did. But times changed in Las Vegas. Casinos turned corporate, and Ted Binion's wild ways started getting him in trouble with the Nevada State Gaming Commission. Number one, he had the heroin problem. He also liked to hang out at adult nightclubs. He used to pal around with wise guys, and you just don't do that in Las Vegas these days and expect to keep your license. In March of 1998, the Gaming Commission revoked his license and Binion was forced to sell his share of the horseshoe to his sister. He was shut out of the place he loved most, the world where he belonged. Nevertheless, few people believe Ted Binion saw suicide as an option. Everybody I have spoken to has indicated Ted loved life and despite his problems, despite his heroin ad addiction, uh, and wanted to continue living and had all kinds of other goals that he wanted to pursue in life. Many believe an accidental overdose was also questionable. Toxicology reports reveal heroin and the prescription drug Xanax. According to some, it was an improbable combination for Ted Binion. Ted only took Xanax to get himself off of heroin. Uh, he would not have taken both at the same time. And then we find out through the corner that there was a large amount of heroin in the contents of his stomach. That's curious again because Ted was known to smoke heroin, not ingest it. And what about murder? At the time of his death, Ted Binion was living with his girlfriend, Sandy Murphy, a woman half his age. Their May-December romance had been going on for about three years. 
They had reportedly met while she was dancing topless at a Vegas strip club. She was then known as Sandy the Irish Venus Murphy. They really had a stormy relationship. It was kind of a love-hate relationship over the years. They were always fighting off and on. And yet, uh, there were times when he would say he loved her, and then there were times when he, he couldn't stand her and wanted her out of the house. The day Ted Binion died, everything seemed normal. About 9 a.m., however, Sandy Murphy reportedly called their housekeeper. Listen, I don't think we're gonna need you to come in today. Oh, I know, um, but Ted, he's just not feeling real well and, and things are crazy, so we're not gonna need you to come in. Uh, is Ted there? Later, about noon, Barbara Brown, Ted's friend and real estate agent, tried to reach him by phone. She says Sandy told her he was very ill, even vomiting. I was really surprised with this. I said, uh, well, do you want me to come over and help you? And she said, oh, God, no, don't come over here. He doesn't want anyone to see him. He's lost so much weight lately. And I said, well, that's strange. I talk to him every night, and we have an appointment tomorrow at 1. I'll come over. I, I can be there in, 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 in under 20 minutes. She clearly did not want me over there, and the call really distressed me. Are you sure? Barbara Brown says she called back twice more that afternoon, at 2 and again at 3.40, but there was no answer. And then I got the call from a friend of mine who said, Barbara, have you heard the news? Ted is dead. And I was just, I had to pull off the road. Allegations soon surfaced that shortly before Ted Binion died, he had certain suspicions. The first thing he, that we learned was that he called a private investigator in Las Vegas, someone who had done work for him uh, previously, and asked the investigator to follow uh, Sandy around town. Um, the implication was that he thought she was cheating on him. The man Ted Binion reportedly suspected was one of his business associates, Rick Tabish. According to Las Vegas newspapers, Sandy Murphy had allegedly been seen with Tabish at a Beverly Hills hotel the weekend before Ted Binion died. Also the day before Ted died, he telephoned his lawyer, Jim Brown, who was handling his estate. And he instructed Brown to cut Sandy out of his will. Less than 36 hours after Ted Binion was reported dead, sheriff's deputies in Pahrump, Nevada, 60 miles west of Las Vegas, made an unusual discovery in the middle of the night. Rick Tabish loading a truck on Binion's property. Come over to the front of the vehicle. What are you guys doing out here? Uh, nothing. You're just uh, moving a little dirt. Moving a little dirt? Yeah. But it wasn't a little dirt. It was a lot of silver. Just a load of dirt, huh? Several tons of silver in coins, ingots, even solid silver bricks. Silver valued at roughly $4 million. This was silver that Ted himself had buried and hired some friends to, to uh, build an underground vault and, and put it in there. Only a few people knew the exact location of the silver vault. One of them was Rick Tabish. I put the vault in for Ted Binion. He was my friend. He told me if anything ever happened to him, I was to take this, turn it into cash, and put it in a trust fund for his daughter, Bonnie. Really? Why don't we put the cuffs on these three guys and get them out of here? Nye County Sheriff's deputies didn't buy his story. I think that Rick Tabish is either one of the bigger victims of circumstance of this decade, or he's got some explaining to do. And people who know him and people who don't care for him now um, wonder about his motivations, for sure. Sandy, are you OK? As the investigation continued, more questions. News reports suggest that when Barbara Brown first called Ted Binion at noon, he was already dead. There's reason to believe that Ted may have died in the morning, sometime after 5.30 a.m. And, and noon. And it, it may be narrowed further. The coroner is working on that. The reality is, is that if a person dies at one time and his death is reported at another time, and there's a, a many-hour gap there, that's an issue that a grand jury might look at sometime. News leaks and public speculation convinced the Binion family to hire private investigator Tom Dillard. 
Dillard claims a Sandy Murphy took a phone call from Rick Tabish eight minutes before she called 911 to report Ted Binion's death. I can't comment on aspects of an ongoing investigation, uh, but based upon my experience and based upon uh, the interviews I've conducted, I personally believe that Ted Binion's death was a homicide. Ted Binion was buried with all the pomp and circumstance appropriate to a Las Vegas high roller. Even the mourners were typically Vegas, judges and politicians side by side with hookers and loan sharks. In the end, though, the final question, how did Ted Binion die? In March, the Clark County coroner ruled that Ted Binion's death was not an accidental overdose or suicide. They declared that fatal doses of heroin and prescription drugs were administered by someone other than Binion, and they reclassified the case as a homicide. Coming up, a Caribbean dream cruise turns into a nightmare when a young woman vanishes. Pleasure cruises. On the surface, they look like a perfectly safe way to take a vacation. But appearances are not always what they seem. According to the New York Times, beneath the carefree party atmosphere lies a little known secret, sexual assaults. Other allegations include thefts and drug smuggling. Some claim crime occurs more regularly than cruise lines would care to admit. During a cruise in March 1998, a 23-year-old woman from Virginia vanished at sea. Was she a victim of foul play? You decide. Amy Bradley was an all-American girl. She attended college on a basketball scholarship she was pretty, outgoing, and made friends wherever she went. But when her parents won a trip to the Caribbean aboard the cruise ship Rhapsody of the Seas, they had to convince Amy to join them. She was afraid of the ocean. Uh, she was reluctant about going up to the uh, rail, and it was kind of like, ugh, that kind of a feeling. But her dad and her brother both said, come on here, and we'll hold on to you. Congratulations. Oh my God, it is so far today. Oh, Bravo, Amy. Yeah. Okay, I got but despite her fears, Amy soon began to enjoy the ship's party atmosphere. On the night of March 24th, their third at sea, Amy and her brother Brad partied late at the ship's nightclub. At 3.40 a.m., Brad returned to the family's cabin. Not long after, Amy joined him. Amy? Sir, could you turn that light off for me, please? Sure. Thanks. <clears throat> hey. She said she hadn't been feeling too well because of the motion of the boat since we left Aruba um, that evening. So she said she was going to just stay out there and get some fresh air. When Amy's dad, Ron Bradley, woke up, Brad had gone to bed and Amy was asleep on the balcony. I could see Amy's legs from her hips down. She looks like she's resting comfortably and uh, dozed back off to sleep. Uh, the, the balcony door was closed because if it hadn't been closed, I would have got it up and closed it. Then just 30 minutes later, their dream vacation turned into a nightmare. About six o'clock, something awoke me again. Got up, looked at on the balcony and the balcony door was open about 14, 16 inches, and Amy wasn't on the deck. And I, was, I had a little funny feeling at that, at that time because it was unlike her to be up that early in the morning. Amy! 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 
Excuse me. <clears throat> we need some help. I'd like to have a page for my daughter is missing. May I ask how old According to Amy's family, the ship's crew was at first reluctant to page Amy. It was too early in the morning. To make matters worse, the ship had just docked in the port of Curacao. Unless it's a medical emergency, we do not page. And I got very, very panicked and frightened. And I asked them to please don't put the gangplank down. You need to lock the ship up. You need to back the ship off of the dock. Don't let anybody off of this boat. Somebody's got my daughter. Amy Bradley, please contact the first desk. The Bradleys claim at 10 minutes to 8, the first page for Amy was broadcast throughout the ship. Amy Bradley, please contact By that time, most of the passengers had disembarked in Curacao. I became more and more frantic because I knew that if she was in a position to hear the announcement, she would come immediately to us. And then I had thoughts that maybe somebody had her in a room and she heard it and couldn't get to us. The nightmare got worse. Eventually, the captain ordered a room-to-room -room search of the 900-foot ship. Ship officials claim they combed through all 10 decks, 999 rooms. No trace of Amy was found. A three-day ocean search by the Royal Dutch Marines turned up nothing. Officials concluded that Amy may have accidentally fallen overboard or even jumped. I don't think that she could have fallen over. She didn't go near the railing, especially by herself. And maybe when I was out there, she would kind of, you know, lean up and look over it. She would never put her hands on the rail or, you know, rest on it. She was just happier standing towards the back. This is one of the last photos taken of Amy. What could have happened to her? The Bradleys began to piece together Amy's last hours on board ship. They believe she left the balcony sometime between 5.30 and 6 a.m. They know she changed her clothes. They know she took her cigarettes. What they don't know was where she was going. And then, intriguing new information. A young woman who met Amy on the cruise is convinced she saw Amy in the early morning hours with a bass player from the ship's band. I saw Amy and the band member walk over and up to the next deck up above us. And then about 10 minutes later, he came walking around by himself. Others claim they had previously seen the bass player flirting with Amy. She said that when they were dancing at the disco, he tried to, you know, dance a little too close and she had to tell him to back off a little bit. That morning, only the Bradley family and the ship's security knew Amy was missing. But according to Amy's brother, so did the bass player. Hey, Brad, sorry to hear about your sister. You know, I feel badly. I know you... That's a really odd thing to say um, that early in the stages of this thing, you know. Nobody knew except for us, or my family and I, and security, that something may be wrong. But authorities could find no evidence the musician was involved with Amy's disappearance. Could Amy have left the ship without telling her family? Her parents don't think so. They believe she was forced to leave. There's rumor and legend surrounding slavery in the Southern Caribbean. It's not uncommon knowledge in the, um, in the maritime community that young white women are considered to be um, very desirable to foreign procurers. Amy would have been a trophy. Amy would have been someone that I believe could have been picked out and fingered to move off of that ship. She could have been held and hidden. She could have been possibly drugged, taken from that ship. I have strong belief that, that she is alive and she's trying to get back to us. And I just pray that one day we'll We'll get a phone call or we'll get some information from someone that will lead us to her. For the Bradleys, the cruise had come to an end. They left the ship hoping someday they would find Amy. How in the world can anybody ever give up looking for their child? Never in my lifetime. Not until I put my hands on her and we get her home. 
Officials of Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines insist that Amy either left the ship voluntarily or was a victim of an unfortunate accident. Her parents disagree and are offering a $250,000 reward for information about their daughter's whereabouts. They're hoping that someone watching tonight was on board the Rhapsody of the Seas and may have seen something. Next, a devoted son dreams that his mother's in a life or death struggle with a prison inmate. Was it just a nightmare or a premonition? I could see my mother's squad car. There was a struggle. I saw the person take my mother's gun. It was a woman. I remember the gun moving back and forth. It looked like my mother really wasn't winning the struggle. She needed help. And that was the most disturbing thing about the whole dream was the fact that I didn't know who was shot and why. The only thing I could think of at that point was that there was a possibility that my mother might have been taken away from me. On September 16, 1995, Thomas Wright had a nightmare about his mother, a deputy sheriff. It was so troubling that he sat in bed and prayed for her. Thomas's mother, Doris Smith, had raised three children single-handedly. She was a grandmother of seven. The bond she shared with her eldest child, Thomas, had always been an extraordinarily strong one. A lot of different things have just really brought us close to where we're just best friends, really. And we can feel each other's hurts anytime. And I didn't know until later why I had the dream. Can nightmares come true? Tom Wright certainly hoped not. Can a prayer be answered? Amazingly, he would find out the very next day. Doris had been in law enforcement in Missouri for three years. She enjoyed breaking up her routine by transporting inmates from one jail to another. On this Sunday, she would be taking a prisoner to a facility four hours away. The inmate was serving a one-year sentence for writing bad checks. They were traveling Highway 54 near Ladonia, Missouri. Events would unfold just as they had in Thomas's nightmare. As the car was driving on the highway, I could see my mother talking to the woman who was in, in back. It was almost as if I was sitting in the front seat, but I really wasn't there. I could see everything that was going on. Remarkably, even the details from Thomas's dream were accurate. At 6 p.m., the squad car stopped. No! What are you doing? And then, yes! chaos. Convict had managed to slip her thin hands out of the handcuffs. No. Doris had to fight for her gun and her life. And I could see my mother's expression. It was almost as if the, the life had just gone from her face. She needed help. Straight jacketed by her seatbelt, Doris was losing. That's when reality diverged from Thomas's dream. Stop. No, you get out of there. Out of nowhere, two men wearing shorts and light t-shirts suddenly appeared. No, 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 no. They managed to distract Doris's attacker. She relinquished her hold on the gun. Was it just coincidence that the Good Samaritans happened by? Or was some mysterious force at work? If I wouldn't have prayed, what would have been the outcome of the events? Would those two men, 
would they have been there to help her? I really think they're really responsible for saving my mother's life. By the time Doris regained her composure, the Good Samaritans had driven off. She never had a chance to express her gratitude for their heroism. I was absolutely convinced that I would die that day. I looked for the men that were there. I wanted to talk to them, wanted to get their names, wanted to thank them for what they had done for me. I want them to know because of their courage and their willingness to help another person, I'm still here today. Thomas and his mother want to thank the people who came to Doris's rescue, but there are a few clues. A bystander took this photo of the men's vehicle, a dark blue Chevy CK pickup truck with tinted windows and an extended cab. It was towing a blue and white boat. The two men were driving near Ladonia in northeast Missouri when they jumped out of their truck to help Doris. It was Monday, September 17, 1995, on Highway 19, about 50 miles from Mark Twain Lake. Join me next time for another fascinating hour of unsolved mysteries.